Hi, this video will cover how to use the live cell incubation chamber uh, on the uh, Zeiss LSM 710. So to use that system to be able to image live cells with temperature control, humidity at a proper level, and CO2 at a proper level, uh, there are a number of additional things we need to turn on the system. Uh, how we turn those additional components on depend on whether the system itself is already on or whether it's completely off, as is the case uh, at the moment. Instructions for how to do the temperature controller startup are posted on the wall, and you can see there are two options. If the system is completely off or if someone was using the system, before you. So if the system is completely off, you can see that the instructions are quite short. It's fairly straightforward. We do a few things uh, and then we follow the standard startup instructions. If the system was already on uh, because someone was using it before you, we need to turn off a bunch of things, uh, then turn on the temperature controller uh, items and then continue with the normal startup. So uh, if we were in that situation, we would just follow these instructions. Again, turning off a number of things, turning on temperature controller um, items, and then continuing with the startup. Because the system at the moment is completely off, we are going to follow these instructions. So the first one is to turn the knob on the CO2 tank to open. The pressure should be 15 PSI. So that um, is over here. Don't touch the knobs that say don't touch. This is the uh, valve to open it. So you open it by turning it counterclockwise. And you can see here, this is the amount remaining in the tank. And this represents the pressure uh, of, the, uh, of the air coming out. And it should be at 15 uh, pounds per square inch or PSI, which is the outer uh, which are the outer numbers. The inner numbers are, I think, inches of mercury. So you can see the outer numbers. It says 10 here, it says 20 there, and so it's in the middle, it's at 15. So that's good. Um, that's done. Let's look at the next step. The next step is to turn the CO2 and temperature control module on. So that's this. And the way we turn that on is there is an on-off button at the bottom right so over here i hope you can see it right there once that's done a bunch of lights turn on once we've done that now we just need to follow the standard startup instructions which are here so remember that um, because we're under these COVID conditions, we also have to make sure we're wearing personal protective equipment, gloves, and do all the disinfection, which I actually did before I started this part of the, of the video dedicated to the live cell component. Uh, but please obviously remember to do those things. So we are now going to do um, the regular startup. Uh, this is exactly the same as in the LSM 710 startup video, so I'm not gonna film this. The microscope has now been turned on. Uh, everything is ready to go. I want to show you one thing that you can check to make sure that your startup procedure for the temperature controller works. So I've refrained from pressing the microscope button because I want to show you that that is going to be slightly different after you've turned on the temperature controller. So if you press the microscope button, what you'll see is that now there is an incubation button down here. Now you don't need to do anything with that, but just the mere presence of that button tells you uh, that this apparatus, which controls temperature and CO2, is working properly. So now that everything is on, let's discuss how to place the incubation chamber on the stage of the microscope, as well as later, how to place a sample inside the incubation chamber. So to be able to do this, first thing we need to do is push this arm back to give us some room. And then we definitely don't want an expensive oil objective, this is the 40X, in position when we're trying to put this heavy object on the stage. So instead, I'm going to switch to the 10X objective by clicking here. So 
So you'll see that because it's changing from oil uh, to an air objective, it gives me this prompt to change the immersion, meaning I should either put on oil or clean oil or whatever it may be. In this case, it's to clean the oil that was already done by the previous person. I'm gonna say done. And then I'm going to lower the 10x objective so that it is not near the top of the of where the uh, stage in insert is going to be. To do that, I'm going to press this load position. Okay. Once that's done, I'm going to remove the current uh, insert, and I will have to put this one on. So let's first take a look at how what the components are here. So there's this lid, okay, that's a heated lid, so if you touch it, it'll feel warm. And this is also where humidified CO2 is inserted. You can see this hose goes to this. So the lid is one component. The other part of this is this. This is kind of a heavy uh, block of metal uh, that will go, it'll be inserted in here, okay? So this is why we, we uh, went to the 10x objective to avoid bumping this thing into something very expensive and fragile. All right, so I'm going to situate the camera in a way that you can see uh, a little bit better when I mount it. And I'll show you how to get that done. So how do we put this on? You can see here the stage. If I flip it over, actually the stage insert, this is the stage. If I flip the stage insert over, you'll see there's sort of a groove here. Okay? So that is what needs to fit in this groove. Okay? So, um, I tend to put it with this cable on this corner, even though that red dot would seem to indicate it should go in that red dot. I just find it more comfortable to keep that cable out of the way there. Again, we want to verify that the 10x is in position and it's all the way at the bottom, which it is. And so now what I'm going to do is, remember, I need to put this groove in this. So the way I find it easiest to do that is to place it here and feel until I can feel the groove in. And so if it's in, it'll slide easily from left to right. And so I'm just going to hold it gently and slide it from left to right, bracing with my uh, left hand against the side there, just as uh, we do when we place a normal uh, uh, stage insert, and then just pull it and gently push it until it drops in position. It's quite heavy, so it'll drop by itself, and you shouldn't be able to move it, okay? Uh, we can use the joystick to center the position that we want. Uh, notice how, how this has um, a spring-loaded holder here, a size adapter here, and a circular region for bigger dishes. Now, if you're using 35 millimeter dishes, you need to grab the following component, which is always around, and then place this adapter ring here. So you can see I've placed it there. This will hold a 35 millimeter dish. You can even tighten it if you want. Uh, if you're okay with the dish being held loosely, and that's usually not a problem, you can just leave it like this. Uh, so if you're using a 35 millimeter dish, you would use this. If you were using a bigger dish, um, you could just use this space. Now make sure that uh, that bigger dish has a cover slip bottom because else you won't be able to use most of the objectives on this microscope. If you're using a NUNC 2, so this chambered cover glass, um, you need to insert it. Let me see if I can find something to point here. So you need to push this back, typically with your finger. So actually, let me do it with my finger. And then you will need to place the nunk on here and on here. And note that between this part and this part, so this edge is actually an edge. So you need to make sure that uh, you place the chambered cover glass here in here, but not on the edge, because if you do, it'll be tilted. In fact, you can actually stress the glass and you can break it. So make sure that you insert it here and there, okay? Uh, for the example the sample that I have, um, it's actually a dish, so you, we won't get be able to see that in, in practice, but 
Um, if you have any uh, questions about how to use a NUNC, a chambered cover glass, uh, let me know. And typically, uh, those work well with this size adapter. Now, if you have a slide which has chambers, uh, you will have to remove this. But keep in mind, again, that a slide is a one millimeter thick piece of glass. You're going to get way worse optical quality, and you won't be able to use any objective on this system beyond the 10x. Uh, so there's really no point in using those chambered uh, slides for live imaging. So since we're going to use a 35 millimeter dish, I am going to put this adapter in. And we'll figure out if we need to screw this in later, okay? So there we have it. Um, just gonna center this. Once we put on the sample, we're then going to put on the lid. So you can see the lid has sort of two cables, this thick one and this thin one. Usually the way I put it in position is I put the thick one kind of in a loop because what that allows me to do is to place it, let me see if I can point this here. I can lay that sort of thick and kind of heavy uh, cable there, whereas the other cable is just hanging off the side. So to reiterate, we need to put the lid on. The lid has, if you can see here, these notches. And those notches go into little pegs on both sides of this. Well, you can't see them there. Uh, actually, it doesn't have any there, excuse me. Uh, it just has two pegs on this side, meaning you can put the lid like this or uh, at 180 degrees. So let's put that there. Um, so that's what it looks like when it's ready to go. It's a good idea to set your sample up uh, first thing uh, so that it has some time to equilibrate uh, because the change in temperature uh, will uh, cause changes in focus. So it's best to leave it some time to sort of settle down before you actually start your imaging. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you want to use um, an oil objective, you will need to put the oil objective in position and oil it before you put your sample on, okay? So that's uh, something to keep in mind um, if you're going to use a, a live sample. Uh, that's actually what I need to do now. So I will let the 10X go up, move to the 40X oil, oil this, and go get my sample to place it on the system. So I'm gonna go do that, uh, and then I'll restart the video. So I have here a 35 millimeter dish. Um, I'm going to remove the lid. I usually place it on this part of the microscope, just for convenience. And then I can place 35 millimeter dish in position here. You can see this particular dish fits quite snugly. The question of whether to leave the lid on or off depends on whether you want to do DIC imaging. Uh, if you do, you should remove it as that kind of imaging, uh, which is a form of bright field contrast enha enhancement, does not work well through plastic, but does work okay through this. Um, so since uh, I actually want to keep the option of doing that for the particular experiment I'm doing now, I am going to remove this, but if you're just doing fluorescence, you can leave the lid on. So I'm gonna remove that. If you wanna hold it very tight, you could move this into position and screw it in with this tool. I don't think that will be necessary. It actually feels quite snug. So now I'm gonna put on the lid. And uh, the, uh, the objective is still in the load position, so I'm gonna raise it and you can see that it hasn't yet touched. Uh, so the oil hasn't made a slick on the sample, so I'm just gonna center it and then raise the objective by turning the focus knob away from me. And hopefully you'll see when the oil touches the sample. There we go. So if I move away from me, the oil slick gets bigger. If I move towards me, the oil slick gets uh, smaller. So this is ready to go. So the next steps uh, are things that we need to do in the software. All right, so I've placed the sample on. 
I've focused by eye on something, and you can see here a DIC image um, of what uh, of, of the particular field I'm in. So how do we set up a time lapse? So if you have live cells, it's typically because you want to look at how they evolve over time. And so how do we do that? So the way we do that is um, we click on time series. Now you'll see we will have a time series tab here. And what we need to define uh, is something very basic. How many images we want to take and how spaced apart we want them. So for example, I could say I want to take five images and I want to take them every five seconds. So let's try that. Let's first go to live. Uh, this has fallen out of focus. Um, so because I'm uh, doing this remotely so I can record it, I'll have to adjust the focus with this focus knob here. Let's see if I can get that. Okay, I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so I'm roughly in focus now. Um, I can stop the live imaging. Once I have the time series set up, what I can do is um, click Start Experiment, and it will take uh, the images that I told it to. So to make this video not so long, I'm just going to do three cycles. So I'm going to take three images spaced five seconds apart. You can see that the scan time for each image is about a second. So there will be enough time uh, to do this. And actually, uh, since it's a second, why don't I do one second intervals and take 10 images? All right, just for the sake of, of, of showing you uh, how that looks. So let's say start experiment. You can see here the time remaining. Once the imaging is done, we can scroll through the time lapse by moving the slider. Now, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that when you're doing uh, live imaging, uh, even if the temperature is stable, uh, there can be small fluctuations which will cause the sample to drift in the z-dimension, meaning things will fall out of focus. Uh, so there's a way to compensate for that uh, in a manner that doesn't uh, bleach the sample or really damage it at all, which is to use uh, the definite focus um, system on the uh, LSM 710. So if you recall, this is one of the things that uh, there's a box and when you're starting the system up, uh, it turns on. Uh, so this is the thing that it's turning on. It's something that allows you to constantly focus on the sample uh, in a time lapse. And the way it works is you have to click here on Focus Devices and Strategy. And in autofocus mode, you want to use definite focus. And you can tell it how often to focus. And so, for example, if you're taking a very quick time lapse, you don't need to focus every time point. But if you're taking images every few minutes, you may want to tell it to do an autofocus every time point. So I'm going to tell it to do it every five images. Uh, what's going to happen uh, when you do that is, be, um, I can't recall if it's right before the fifth or after the fifth image, it, it will shoot an infrared laser uh, at the sample and find uh, the same focus position as where it started. So what this means is the following. We are currently in some position in Z, uh, which is defined by a certain distance from the interface between the cover slip, which is where the cells are lying, and uh, the, the sample's media. Uh, that interface can be found by this focus device. Uh, and then what it does is it simply adds the, the spacing from that interface uh, to kind of find the same focal position you were in. Now, this will help if there are drifts due to temperature. It won't do anything for you if the cells ball up or the cells move out of focus uh, because they moved relative to the cover slip. However, if the cover slip uh, and cells are moving together and the cover slip is moving relative to the objective because of thermal expansions or contractions, that's what this will allow you to compensate for. And so let's, uh, you know, I've turned it on. Let's see um, how this works. So if you go to start experiment, 
you will see here that when it does the definite focus, there will be a message definite focus setting focus. And there it goes. And uh, if you were in the room, you could see in the um, display uh, of the definite focus, some messages that indicate that it is finding the focus and then setting it. Okay, so this is really critical uh, if you want to have something that's in focus, particularly in a long time lapse. Uh, something else to keep in mind uh, if you are doing time lapses is uh, to check whether, um, you know, under what conditions you have bleaching. Uh, because these are live cells, they're typically uh, the fluorophores that you use are uh, typically more delicate uh, than the ones that you would use on fixed cells, and, and you almost never have any kind of uh, kind of mounting media because that would kill the cells. So uh, the fluorophores can be more prone in some cases to bleaching than the ones that you would use for staining fixed tissue. And in addition, you don't have uh, the, the mounting media that would uh, reduce the bleaching rate as you would uh, if you were doing fixed imaging. So checking whether something is bleaching uh, is typically a, a good use of your time. Um, so let me show you how to do that. Uh, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm optimizing uh, right now myself. So we have samples and uh, there's two channels. One is we hit it with 488 and we get kind of emission in the, in the GFP range. Uh, let me go to live and see if we can find an area. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be much here. Okay, let's see. I'm just uh, lowering the white value just so I can see something. Let me see if I can move in Z to find something a little brighter. Okay, so let's see, you know, this is probably some piece of garbage, but for the sake of just showing whether there's a lot of bleaching, it'll it'll work just fine. Um, so how, how do we keep track of whether something's bleaching? So the, the, the way we're gonna do this is we're going to do uh, live imaging I'll do it uh, over uh, 30 uh, cycles, so that'll be a total of 29 seconds. Um, that'll give me enough time to draw a little box here, similar to what we do in the histogram mode, uh, but it will uh, generate a different graph that shows me the intensity uh, of the, the pixel values in here as a function of time. And if there's significant bleaching, that will be going down. If there's not, it'll just be oscillating. So let's let's see, let's try that out. So I'm gonna go to start experiment, uh, going back to range indicator. And now uh, what I'm going to do is uh, go to mean ROI and draw something here. I'm gonna change this and then I'm going to just stretch this out a little bit. Uh, just zoom in so we can see. These red uh, things are where the definite focus acted. And so you can see there's a very slight trend going down. Um, it's not you know, terrible. But what if we uh, increase the laser power to let's say 20%. So let me go to live. Uh, so now we can sort of see everything very clearly. I'm going to reduce the gain a little bit to 700 just so that's not saturated. And now I'm gonna try this experiment again. So let's see how the bleaching curve compares to this. Um, so let's go to start experiment. I have to set up range indicator again. Uh, I'm gonna to go to mean ROI again. I'm gonna draw a little box here. Move this and zoom in. And so let's see if this changes the result. So, so far it actually doesn't seem to be doing that badly. It's going down a little bit, but it wasn't the end of the world. Um, so, however, if this is going down kind of dramatically, then you can get a situation uh, where you really do need to worry about the bleaching. Also, you know, we, we imaged 30 images. Um, if we had gone for much longer, so more images, 
this slight trend, so a slight decrease in intensity, uh, becomes a big decrease in intensity, and, and then we have to start worrying. In any case, the fact that this didn't happen in this particular sample is, is fine, uh, but I've shown you the tools with which to evaluate whether it's happening in your sample. And if it is happening, uh, remember the things that you can do uh, to reduce uh, bleaching, which are namely, uh, if you want to um, retain quality, uh, you can trade off time for bleaching by, instead of doing a high laser power, lowering the laser power and increasing the gain, but then getting the same quality by increasing the average in a similar way. So for example, if we were at 20 uh, uh, laser power and we were getting a nice image and we want, you know, we have significant leaching, we could reduce that to, for example, five, which is four times less, and then get the same quality by averaging four times. It will take four times longer. So if we need to take a very quick imaging, that's not gonna work very well. Uh, but if our imaging has longer intervals, that might be an acceptable solution. That will reduce bleaching. Um, the other option is to trade off quality uh, for bleaching. So you can reduce the laser power and increase the gain and not do anything to the averaging and just live with the fact that the quality will be lower. And so often when we're doing live cell imaging, uh, we're much more constrained in what we can get away with. So you really have to uh, and by get away with, I mean get away with without destroying the fluorophores that allow us to do our experiment, uh, or even the cells themselves. Um, so you really need to err on the side of caution uh, with live cells, uh, because if you see bleaching, you are definitely uh, damaging the cells, and if you don't, you might be damaging them. So uh, another uh, good control is uh, to maybe look at a position uh, where you did the imaging, uh, and look at sort of the quality of the cells, for example, with a, a DIC image before and after you did the imaging, and then look at an adjacent region where you didn't illuminate it uh, and see, you know, take a picture of it before you start the imaging, and then go to the same location, take a picture afterwards, and see if, if the region where you took the images, there's significant blebbing and, and destruction, um, you know, that tells you that that was a result of the light, if that's absent in your sort of control that you did not, uh, control region that you did not image. So let me show you uh, one more thing, which is how to um, do this kind of experiment over multiple positions. So this is frequently something that we need. Um, so to do that, uh, I'm going to switch back to this uh, just because I have a, a very nice the uh, observable DIC image. Okay, so this is, this is sort of very clear. Um, it actually looks nicely in focus. Because we're going to be moving around, I can't have a time series where the interval is so uh, small. It won't give the system time to move around to different locations. So again, every time you add something to the experiment, there's a cost. So if we add multiple positions, we'll get more data. Um, but we will be in a situation where we can't image as quickly. Um, so let me just uh, make the interval 30 seconds, and we'll just take... Um, three images. Um, so how do we add multiple positions? So there's sort of two ways we can do this. One is we can say, well, instead of taking this image, what I would like to do is take a bigger image, but in the same region, sort of a three by three. So you can do that by using tile scan. And so if we scroll down here, this is the tile scan. So we could do something like a three by three centered uh, in this same position. And if we click online stitching, it'll be stitched by the time we're done. So if we did this, it would take uh, nine images, which would take about 10 seconds-ish, plus the travel time of the uh, of the system. So maybe we can get away with a 20 second interval and then it'll repeat that every 20 seconds. So let's see uh, what that looks like. So if we start the experiment, here we go. You can see the estimated remaining time here. You can see when it's waiting, it'll tell you how long it, it uh, remains to be, um, remains in the wait time here. Um, you saw that, um, so that's at seven, six, five, 
four, three, two, one. So it took about 15 seconds to take the images. The reason you don't see much change here, uh, well, actually there you, you saw a little bit of change is um, there's not much going on. I'm not really doing much. Um, and see a little bit of drift. Uh, the reason you see the shading, this is typical in DIC. Um, so yeah, you, you shouldn't worry about that. There's it's not easy to correct for that. Um, so don't worry about that. This is more illustrative of how you can do multiple positions with tile scan. Um, but maybe let's say you actually, um, you don't want uh, to take all of these. For example, in this, in this particular sample, there are some cells that seem attached and some seem cells that seem kind of floating around. Uh, so maybe you only want to take images of the attached cells because you only care about those. So maybe we just want to mark positions where those cells are. Um, instead of doing these sort of three by three. So how do you do that? So to do that, we're going to use the positions tab. Uh, and the way this works, if you go here, is we have a list of positions to which we can add them. And so we can either um, go to live and just move around and add positions um, as we have them, or we can do this strategy where we take uh, a, a, a low um, mag, not a low mag, but this sort of tiling, and then use this map as a way to find positions. So I've done that here, and I will show you an alternative uh, for how to do that um, same same strategy. Uh, but let's, you know, since I have this, let me take advantage of that uh, option uh, to show you how to add positions. So if I click Stage, this shows me where I am currently with the stage in my sample. So I can say, you know what, I want to center here, and I want that to be position number one, and then I want this to be right here, position number two, and then I want this down here to be position number three. Um, so that's actually not the most efficient way because I'm here, then I'm here, then I'm here, instead of you know going in one order. So what I can do is move this. So this becomes the first position, then we go here and here, which is sort of a more efficient um, travel. So the stage will take an image here, then here, then here, which makes more sense. Um, let's see um, how we move between the positions. So if I go to live, um, you can see um, this, th this particular one. If it's out of focus, we can refocus by clicking here. And so now if we want to update the positions, uh, Z Z um, coordinate, we can click here on update. We can then go to the next one and make sure it looks good. So if I click on it and then say move to, there we go. Um, this one looked good because it was where we were, it was the one in the middle where we were imaging before. And then we can go to this final one. And that one actually doesn't look bad. So uh, we can leave those alone. So now we have these three positions. We have the, the, um, the autofocus on. Um, and we're, we're auto-focusing every time point um, and uh, every second time point and every second uh, position. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's start the experiment and see what happens. Actually, I'm not sure if this is... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what this means. Um, all right, so after some tests, it seems that um, we need to set this to one uh, to make sure that uh, every position uh, receives autofocus. Um, and I've set it so that it'll do it every time point in this particular um, imaging run. Let's see uh, what this looks like when we actually run the experiment. You can see down here when the definite focus is being engaged. You can also see um, those bars up there. Now we're in the wait interval. There's a 20 second wait between uh, each imaging of the um, each imaging run. So we've done the definite focus. We're doing it again. We're doing it again. We've completed the second cycle with three positions. And we're in the wait interval, and we're about to start the third cycle. So it's focusing, take an image, take another image, and take another image. So you can see that now there are sliders for time and position. So this is 
the three time points for position number one. These are the three time points for position number two. And these are the three time points for position number three. So you can see uh, with what I've shown you how to take a time lapse at multiple positions uh, while doing autofocus at each position. If in addition to this, uh, you want to add Z stacks, um, let me know. That uh, has its own complications. Uh, so I'm not going to discuss that in this video. Uh, but if uh, there are cases of people that want to do that, um, I, I can either explain in person or if there's more than one, I will eventually make a video showing how to do that, uh, which has some sort of sort of added complications um, for the setup. So I've concluded my live cell imaging. Now I need to go over how to shut this down. The instructions for shutdown are here and they're different depending on whether someone is coming within the next two hours or not. So it just so happens that someone is coming within the next two hours, so I need to do this longer shutdown procedure, um, which will involve shutting down the temperature controller, uh, as well as some other things on the system and then turning them back on uh, so that the system is working without the temperature controller on. If we just turn off the temperature controller and don't reset the other things indicated here, the next person will get a bunch of error messages. So let's follow the instructions. Uh, first step is to turn the knob on the CO2 tank to off. So if you recall, this is the CO2 tank. Turning it clockwise turns this off. There we go. This will take some time to go down. All right, so what's next? I want to exit Zen. Turn off the component switch, Let's switch number six. Turn off the system's PC switch, number four. Turn the CO2 and temperature controller off. Remember, that's the switch that's back here. So, right there. You can see the lights are off on that. Now we need to turn on the system's PC switch. So we go here, turn this on. We need to wait for the definite focus to turn off and wait until the touchscreen finishes loading and press the microscope button. All right, so we need to wait for that to say off. Okay, we're going to go to this, press the microscope button. You'll see that there is no longer an incubation uh, button there, so that's good. Turn on component switch, wait 30 seconds. The 30 seconds are done, so now I need to start Zen. All right, so that concludes the startup instructions here. The other thing, uh, excuse me, the shutdown instructions for the temperature controller uh, here when someone else is coming. Now we need to uh, put this back in position. So you can see I was using a 40X oil objective. Before I remove it, I want to go to load position to lower that objective. You can see it's far away. Now I can open this up, remove this sample. And I can now remove this very gently. Place it on the side table here. And do the same for the lid. See there? Uh, so what remains is to clean that objective. And then once we've cleaned it, to put on this for the next person. So I'll do the cleaning off camera, but uh, once you've done that, 
um, it's ready for the next person. I'm just gonna tell Zen to start system. And when the next person comes in, uh, which is going to be in about half an hour uh, today, they'll have everything ready for imaging. If you have any questions, please let me know.